DevOps Talks conferences. Uh, how's it going today? Yeah, really good. Really, Great. Yeah, fantastic day today. Would you mind introducing yourself? Sure, my name's Dimitri. I'm a director at Message Media Group, and we're one of the sponsors at DevOps Talks this year. Yes, and how's it been as a sponsor here at DevOps Talks? Um, it's been fantastic. Like, it's the first one that I've spent a fair uh, decent time um, mm -hmm. in amongst the developer community. Okay. Um, and I think it's been uh, great for our organization to connect with that community and share insights into what we're doing um, in DevOps, um, but also share insights into our technology stack and yeah. how it can power certain outcomes. That's very cool. I've, I've noticed that your, your stand seems to always have people around it having conversations. I don't know if it's because of the personnel or whether it's the um, headphones we're giving away. <laughs> it could be that too. Um, but we had a lot of great conversations, um, mm -hmm. sharing again insights into what we're about and what we're doing and where we're going. Um, and essentially how we can help the community power great outcomes with, with the technology stack, obviously. Right. And one of your colleagues gave a talk earlier today as well. Ben Mustafa, yeah. yeah. It's Did actually you? the first time I've heard Ben speak oh. in such a forum. Uh -huh. um, and I gave him the feedback before. I said, it's been great listening to you talk about our journey and the way we uh, manage um, DevOps. Um, so it was really good, really good. Yeah. Totally enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it as well. Um, have you had the opportunity to listen to other talks while you've been here? I've been in and out. Okay. So gotcha. I'll be honest with you, I've been yeah. in and out. But sure. um, by all accounts, uh, two of our team members spent a bit of time. Okay. And the feedback's been very positive from them. And also speaking to a lot of the um, developers as they came to yes. our stand, um, all positive, mm -hmm. um, which is great. And yeah. it all obviously gives us confidence um, to reconnect again at the next event. All right, great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us at the DevOps Talks Conference. No, no, it's been a real pleasure. All right. Thank great. you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome to the last session of the day. Uh, this session is keeping secrets with Google GKE and HashiCorp Vault. Uh, my name is Aaron Bowden, and that is me. Uh, hopefully all of you started getting a bit of an Android sticker as well. Uh, so I'm a customer engineer with Google Cloud. Uh, I'm also going through something of a bit of a retro uh, computer thing at the moment, so bear with me. Um, but uh, if any of you want to discuss the Amiga 1200 up at Whirly Birds after this, uh, come and find me because uh, I'll bore you to death. Uh, so uh, hopefully I won't do that with my presentation today. Uh, so what I am here to talk about is what's secret management? What are secrets? Uh, one particular technology that's really starting to get a lot of adoption uh, being HashiCorp Vault. Uh, I'll then demonstrate how to build those services on GKE. And then I'll show you how to deploy an app that can actually then consume uh, Vault. Uh, to obtain dynamic GCP credentials to access Google Cloud services. So one of the themes of the conference that I've picked up on is one of uh, security. Okay? So it's not enough just to have all of these agile distributed microservices scaling everywhere if the doors are left unlocked and the keys are left throwing around. Uh, you need to ensure that you know, everything's clean cut. But before, before we start to sort of dig too deep, I think it's best that we sort of go back uh, so we all can get to the same jumping off point with the basic premise. And that basic premise is, what is a secret? Someone tells you a secret. What are they actually doing? So secrets in our context are things that let you authenticate or authorize against a service. Things like username and password, API token, TLS certificate. They're usually used to uh, constrain or, or restrict access to these sensitive uh, information like credit card, tax file number, 
passport number, Medicare number. Uh, it's a case of uh, knock, knock on the, on the door. Guy opens up the door, what's the password? Okay, the secret is the password. The sensitive data is whatever's in that room that you're trying to access. I don't need to know what's inside the room. You guys can let your imagination play with it. So as you can appreciate, in modern, arc, modern infrastructures, rather, uh, there are many doors. There are many gates. And therefore, there are many, many secrets. Uh, secret management is the idea uh, around keeping uh, all of that under control. So we need to be able to ask these questions. Okay? Application wants to connect to a database. How does a database get a password? If I'm a DBA and I want to maybe fix a problem, how do I get the credentials for doing that while you know, not leaving my, my passwords everywhere? We don't want the credentials to live forever either. We want them to be time boxed. We don't want them to last forever. Um, how, is, how do they get updated? How is that application impacted? How do I automate this? And what if it's compromised? Okay, so one of the big things about secrets, what happens if someone steals that key? How do you revoke it? How do you make sure that it's not in use? So where is the world now? And I'm sure I'm not surprising anyone here, uh, but the world's not in a good place. Okay, you've got secrets sprawled out everywhere through your infrastructure. Uh, they're very, very difficult to find. Um, sometimes they're hard-coded in source. Uh, in plain text, config files on file systems. Um, who's gone and found uh, somebody's root key up on GitHub? Uh, anyone? <laughs> so it's a, it's a very decentralized way of dealing with it. Uh, and it limits the access controls that you have around it as well. And visibility is even worse. So who's looked at that file? Who, who actually has access to it? Well, who's done what with it? You don't know. So it's a little bit like this. So trying to find all the secrets, what's where, you don't know. So this is where HashiCorp Vault comes in. Uh, so HashiCorp Vault uh, helps provide a good, question, a good answer, I should say, uh, to these questions. So HashiCorp have been working with Google uh, to integrate Vault recently with GCP. And uh, it was recently presented at our next conference. Uh, Vault moves away from that decentralized model by bringing everything into a central secret uh, management system. It allows for different consumers, so applications through APIs or operations people through CLI or user interface, um, to fetch a credential, um, use it, uh, and then for that cr credential to then be uh, revoked or cycled out when time permits. A central repository is essentially a place to store data. So you're putting the data in, uh, you need that to be secure, and then you need to get them out again somehow. So to do that, uh, Vault ensures that uh, in transit, that the uh, data is encrypted in TLS 1.2, and at rest, uh, it's encrypted uh, AES 256. Uh, and that's actually doing encryption uh, and authentication as well, so you can detect any tampering on your secret database. Because as you can understand, uh, if you're decentralizing everything and uh, sorry, centralizing everything into a, uh, a database, you want to make sure that that's very, very secure. So what users see is they see a hierarchical uh, key value store. So you can get a good group of things uh, and just make sure that it makes sense to you so it's, so it's usable. So at this point, it's all sounding very theoretical and uh, maybe it's time to actually demonstrate a little bit what this is. So what I've got up here is just an, an example of a CLI that shows you how you write a, uh, a, a secret into a path, in this case, secret foo, uh, which is like a directory folder type of structure, uh, and into the page of secrets. So we write the values, okay, and it's password, you know, Amiga 1200, uh, password, user key is Aaron password, uh, and that's a key value store, so that's stored in there. And so what's happening underneath there is Vault's abstracting that TLS tunnel. Uh, so making sure that it's still uh, connecting to uh, Vault through a, a secure channel. Uh, and then it's masking um, and then retrieving back, when I read it, uh, retrieving back uh, the key from the encrypted storage. And of course, you can do the same thing with an API. So if you don't always have to have the, the CLI there, if you want to call that direct from an application with the API direct, 
uh, you can do that there. And this is just essentially the same command, um, but just using curl to hit the REST API. Okay, so using curl, it encodes the data. We've got that header there, the uh, XVault token. I'll talk more about that uh, later on. Uh, and then you can see there that it's reading the, the, uh, the, the key. And so that goes through, decrypts the secret on the storage, sends it back through the, cult, to, through the uh, HTTPS channel. Okay, so slow down there, Professor. What about when a developer or an ops guy can't be bothered uh, with any of this? All these central, I've, se I've used secret management systems before. What happens if I just can't be bothered and I'll log into it once and I'll save all of my username and passwords into a text file that then I just store in my home directory? Uh, sound familiar, anybody? Uh, I see some nods over there. Uh, so what this is about is, you know, these, these are the harder questions. Okay, you're not gonna be able to, how would you stop something like that? Well, this is when these credentials, okay, uh, need to be time bound, okay? So you've got this world of long lived static credentials and they, you, you set something up, let's just say it's a, a GCP IAM account or something like that, and you give a key and, and they, the key lasts for a very, very long time, maybe forever, okay? So that means that if they get out there, they're still valid. So you've got this world of either something is completely perfectly secure or it's completely pwned and you're done. So how do we minimize that blast radius? Okay, so what you can do is you can cycle out those credentials. Okay, so just imagine, you know, you make, you're making that credential ephemeral, temporary, time box. Maybe it only lasts for 30 minutes, maybe less, depending on what your, what your uh, policy is. And you've got an app that mistakenly decides that it wants to log the connection string, including the username and password straight out to the logging system in clear text. Oops, that's happened. But the blast radius is constrained because 30 minutes later, that credential is not gonna be valid anymore. Okay, uh, and of course, you can revoke it earlier uh, if you discover that it's been uh, compromised. So, so what does a client see? Okay, so they're just doing a read against Vault, like we just did before. So you can use the API, you can use the CLI. And then behind the scenes, it's going out and it's talking to an endpoint. In this case, it's Google Cloud. Okay, it's saying, hi, Mr. Google, give me a credential. I'm gonna go back, provide that credential back to my client, okay, uh, and then I will uh, cycle it out. And it doesn't have to be Google Cloud either. It supports pretty much any system that supports credentialing as well. So in this example, let's just imagine that I've got a bucket, so a Google Cloud storage bucket, uh, and I don't want a credential that lives forever. So I want something that only lasts for 24 hours. And then I'm rotating that credential all the time. So I will request from Vault, uh, Vault will go create the, the credentials, that will provide it back to me, and then after 24 hours, that credential is revoked, and then Vault can uh, Vault can provide me a new one. Okay, so it's essentially Vault is helping to create dynamic, short-lived credentials. Okay, and it's also providing that audit trail for the application. So auditing becomes important again. If you remember your three A's, which I do have a slide up just to remind everybody who's maybe needs a, a reminder on it. <laughs> Um, so look, the, the general idea is that uh, the credentialing to manage authentication uh, and authorization, uh, any system that, that needs to deal with those has similar challenges, okay? So it's not just cloud providers, it's databases, it's queuing pipelines, it's directory systems, it's you know, your uh, PKI infrastructure, okay? Uh, so Vault is, uh, so people need credentials to access those systems. Um, and they don't want the credentials to live forever. And you might be wondering, well, why don't I just talk to Google Cloud directly and just rotate those keys manually with KMS or something like that? The, the point is here is that it's actually a plug-in point, okay? So it's giving you um, that centralized point that you can talk to and understand to, to regardless of what backend that you're using. You might be getting a credential from GCP one day, you might be getting a credential from AWS another day and a credential for your RabbitMQ. Okay, um, perfect example. Um, 
how do we make sure that a token that's living on one of your Jenkins build servers uh, doesn't live forever? Okay, so how do we constrain what happens if that um, Jenkins... Or who's ever shared the master pem file with the development team just because it was Friday afternoon and they wanted it and you didn't want to have to set them up? I didn't do that. Uh, so again, we're just coming back full circle into the basics. Okay, so the security is three A. So it's authentication, authorization, and auditing. So many auth authentication systems, okay? So you can use any of these third parties to talk with Vault, okay? So um, Vault will then check those credentials, provide you a token, uh, and then will then issue you credentials from a backend secret engine, okay? Um, the central authorization system, which is essentially allowing you what to do now once you've proved your identity, um, can say, yes, you're entitled to get that uh, GCS bucket um, service account credential. And of course, auditing for security um, that you know, lets you know exactly who had access to what secret at what time uh, so that when uh, time comes to, provo to prove your security stance, uh, you can do it without uh, too much hassle. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I am now going to show you how to run Vault on Google Kubernetes Engine. Now, the goal of the section is to answer two questions. First question, should I run this on GKE? Yes. Next question, how do I do it? So this is where I get brave and pray to the demo gods and I will show you how we do this. So I'm utilizing Terraform in this demo. Okay, so Terraform, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, uh, but basically it's going to help me orchestrate a lot of these uh, tools. So you can see here, here is my Google Cloud account with my different projects. There is my Terraform administrator project, which is this Terraform worker here. And I will kick that off. Okay, so while that's running, I'll go through and explain exactly what's happening. Okay, so this is a very, very, very high level architecture um, about what we're building here, okay? So this architecture was developed in conjunction with some Google engineers uh, with HashiCorp for our next uh, conference, as I mentioned before. Uh, and you can actually find the code for this um, at that GitHub repo. So um, Seth Vargo is one of our developer advocates. Uh, and uh, he actually has uh, quite a lot of material up there on GitHub for uh, HashiCorp Vault, for those of you who might want to try it out for yourself. So this is what we like, like to think of um, as our best practice. Okay, because what this is going to give you is uh, a highly available vault cluster. Okay, the elements here, so what you can do is you can see the load balancer there providing an entry point for three vault servers. That can be three, five, seven vault servers, depending on what your uh, performance requirements are. Sitting behind that, okay, so uh, we've got cloud storage as a storage backend, and we're also then using a cloud KMS to uh, do the encryption for the root token so that when Vault um, first uh, creates itself, there is a root token that you need to be able to unseal the Vault. Uh, and so you don't want to store that token uh, in clear text anywhere, so we're going to be using Cloud KMS to make sure that we encrypt that. Uh, we're also running on Kubernetes Engine, uh, because I don't think anyone's really too interested in running uh, Kubernetes clusters themselves. Um, but it just makes it very, very easy for us um, to deploy a highly available cluster up very, very quickly. So some of the highlights, uh, as I was mentioning before, is this is going to create Vault in its own GCP project. Okay, so the idea of that is that it's a very tightly controlled thing. You don't want just anybody accessing your Vault. Ideally, uh, it's a uh, separate Google Cloud project that only the security team have access to. So then the other services or clusters or things that are running out there, if they're in other GCP projects themselves or, or elsewhere, they just see Vault as a thing at an IP address. When we're using the storage, the storage is in this case uh, blob storage, so Google Cloud Storage. Uh, that gives us a few advantages, uh, particularly around high availability because we can use um, replication, 
Uh, we can also use customer supplied encryption keys uh, if you really want to uh, take that next level of protection against your vault um, storage. Um, but also Google Cloud Spanner is a, uh, another supported backend um, if you have a, a very serious global scalability need for that. Uh, Cloud KMS, as mentioned, uh, that's what's going to automatically initialize and unseal and reseal Vault. Okay, so remember that Vault needs to be unsealed before it's in a usable state once it runs. So KMS encrypts those, uh, stores them on GCS so that uh, you just can't read from the bucket. So in addition, okay, we're going to be using our own custom CA for, for TLS. Uh, one of the few things that I asked when I was sort of learning about Vault is why wouldn't I just use Let's Encrypt? Uh, the, the scenario there is that you could, but you don't really want to trust every certificate that's out there. Uh, what you want to do is you want to do this for mutual TLS valid validation. So you want to make sure that only the people with the right certificates uh, have the ability to communicate with the server. Okay, uh, and yes, I'm running it on uh, Kubernetes, but honestly, uh, we shouldn't care. Okay, so um, very much like any of the other sort of like uh, API type of discussions that we've seen uh, earlier today, uh, it should just be an interface that you communicate with and you have faith that it's, that it's up and running and those who are looking after Vault need to conform to that. Okay, so uh, a little bit into the actual uh, deployment configuration for, uh, for the Kubernetes YAML file. Uh, so what we're using here is we're using stateful sets. Okay, so um, it's interesting because the Vault cluster uh, containers themselves actually aren't stateful. Uh, but what we want to do is uh, the stateful sets gives us a, a couple of really interesting uh, features. So first of all, it gives us predictable naming so that when they launch, it's Vault 0, Vault 1, Vault 2. Uh, it's helpful for debugging and logging. But actually, the real reason that we use it is uh, it gives us exactly once semantics when it runs. So it runs initializes Vault, unlocks it, and then when the next one goes to do it, okay, it can actually say, oh, I'm already unlocked, I'll just proceed, I won't have any type of race conditions. Okay, so it's basically to support that um, automatic unsealing. Uh, we've got uh, pod anti-affinity rules, which, pop quiz, what's the opposite of anti-affinity rules? Affinity rules, congratulations, Aaron. Um, so what that means is we're going to make sure that none of the pods are all running on the same node. No point having three Kubernetes hosts if all the pods are running on the same host. Uh, we want to be compliant with our requirement for high availability, um, and so that's what that does. So auto unsealing is also a uh, initialization container. Okay, so you can see there, um, Seth from our de uh, Dev Advocate team. Uh, he's actually created one already. Uh, and then what that does is it's a sidecar. It, uh, once Vault is running, it goes in there, um, gets the token, makes sure it does the unsealing, uh, and then uh, gets Vault up and running very quickly without any manual intervention. Uh, little things make a big difference. Okay, so um, one of the things that you um, don't get by default um, in containers is memory locking. But if, with Kubernetes, if you provide the IPC lock uh, security context, you can actually get that memory locking feature. So that actually increases your security standpoint when you're running these containers on shared infrastructure like Kubernetes. Okay, um, we've got a health check there. So it's actually uh, Vault comparing for, uh, checking for its uh, own readiness. Uh, just keep in mind there that we are using HTTPS. So everything's secure at all times. Um, and that basically just tells us when it's alive. And lastly, as we saw in that diagram, we actually have a layer four load balancer, not a layer seven load balancer. Uh, the reason for this is we want Vault to be able to do its own TLS manipulation. We don't want to have two TLS sessions, okay? We don't want to have that SS, uh, the TLS termination happening on a layer seven load balancer and then a second session. We want that just to be passed through. And that's got to do with that mutual TLS that I was talking about before. So why don't I put my money where my mouth is and actually see whether or not this worked. And there we go. Okay, we can see that it's unsealed, that it's uh, running at this endpoint. Okay, first thing you might be noticing is he's running his secret management database on a public IP. Um, in production, you wouldn't do that. 
but never let little facts like that get in the way of a good demo. Um, so in the terminal here, okay, so if we just um, show you, increase that as well. Okay, you can see there that it's automatically generated the Vault project. It has created the cluster and has deployed Vault. Okay, you can see here the containers running there are Vault 1012, so that's the stateful naming that I was talking about before. And you can see there that there is actually an init container as well. So that's actually that init container that's doing the unsealing and the automation and making that easy uh, to automate. If you go into, into this as well, you can actually see the uh, environment variables that are passed to it through config sets. Okay, and that's actually able to see exactly where the KMS key ID and that type of thing sit. All right, I'll show you also the storage uh, bucket before we move on to the next part. So you can actually just see how that looks. Okay, so there is the uh, vault bucket that's been configured as the back end. And there we go, here is the file system for vault. Okay, and you can see there that root token is encrypted and that's what's been encrypted with Cloud KMS. That's cool, all right. So in a couple of scripts, what you've got is you've got a highly available secret management system deployed in containers, ready to use, but it's really only half of the story. So what happens if you have a container that's running on GKE, an application that's running on GKE that actually wants to use Vault? So remember, Vault is now just a thing on an IP address. So what we can do is we'll trigger off another configuration, which is actually a separate project running a separate GKE cluster to keep things in their own security boundaries. Um, and then that will create us an application um, that we can then use uh, Vault. So with Vault, what we've got is we've got this um, authentication process where you've got users or machines that need to supply information to Vault um, and then Vault checks that information about their identity. Okay, so you've got this third party system. Okay, it might be uh, you know, a, a Google identity or it might be an LDAP identity or a Kubernetes service account or something like that. Um, you will then send that to uh, Vault. Vault will need to check and validate that, that, that identity is correct. If it gives you um, an AOK, -okay, that identity is correct, it will give you back a Vault token. Now, a Vault token uh, is like a session ID. Um, conceptually, it's very, very similar to um, uh, the OAuth model that you'd all probably be familiar with. Um, so this lets you uh, not be constrained to different types of identity uh, storage directories or anything like that. Um, in our demo, what we're building here is we're actually going to leverage uh, Kubernetes service accounts, okay, and the service accounts in, in GCP. Um, so in this case, the third uh, party identity has been replaced by the Kubernetes token reviewer API. Okay, so uh, what happens is we have a, a service account, okay, that is running on uh, Kubernetes engine. Uh, that will then present itself to uh, Vault. So remember, that's the same uh, service account token that's uh, initialized uh, when it's first brought up. It then validates that against Kubernetes and says, hey, is that actually um, you that's made this request? Let me validate that. Um, Kubernetes token reviewer API says, yep, that's a valid request. Vault says, okay, looks good, here's a token. So that token uh, is then bound to a policy. Okay, now that policy is what tells you what type of uh, secrets you have access to. So you might have access to um, Google Cloud Storage um, service accounts. You might have access to Google Cloud um, virtual machine accounts. Okay, um, so it will then provide you that back and then you can, your application can decide what to do with those credentials. Okay, that's basically what the kube auth model looks like at a very, very high level. Okay, so again, we're going to be talking about a, uh, an init pod. Okay, so in this case, it's actually not a sidecar, it's an init container, uh, which means that it's going to have to stop everything uh, 
if it doesn't pass. So it just basically must succeed in order for the other containers to run. Yeah, cool. But what happens if my credentials change? You've been telling me all about these dynamic secrets. What happens in that scenario? Okay, so most applications, right, what they do is, is they'll only read the config once. They'll need to get some sort of signal to reload their config. Okay, so if they're not having that type of um, automation built into the application, you're going to have to have some sort of external service, something like console template or something along those lines that can send a signal into your application and say, hey, I've been monitoring Vault. This has changed. I'm now going to uh, update and reload the credentials uh, with the new creds. So keep in mind, that's not just for uh, Kubernetes as well. That could be anything even like a, a database connection string, something like that. Okay, so this is um, what we're doing here. This is basically utilizing a simple shell script um, that takes that uh, vault token that's been returned. So that uh, init container will basically take into its uh, memory store that vault token, store it on a, uh, a memory drive. Okay, so nothing's persisted to disk here. Uh, and then we can make that available to other containers within the pod as well. Uh, we then uh, get the, uh, using that token, we then basically uh, authorize ourselves into Vault, uh, and then Vault returns back the GCP credentials that are related to that KS demo key role set. Okay? So let me just check how this is going. So he's still running. Okay, and so what this basically means is if I go and have a show you guys the actual, you can see here, this is the YAML file, okay? So the application is just called Vault Sidecar. Uh, you can see there that the Vault token, okay, uh, is being mounted as a memory mount. So remember, we're not persisting any of this secure token into, into disk, okay? And then we've got that Vault Authenticator, okay? So this is a, uh, an init container, okay? So you can see there, that's actually an init container. Um, it's got the location to the Vault CA certs, uh, calling back before that we need to trust the certs because we want that mutual TLS. Uh, once you've got that uh, in place, um, other applications can then actually read this vault token, okay? Uh, we're telling it what role, so essentially um, what policy am I allowed to do? And then I've got an application here which is just a, a generic uh, Debian container to show how it works. Um, I've mounted that same path memory path into the um, container as well, uh, which will then pass along the um, well-known path for GCP credentials. So in that case, um, lastly, we need to do is just see that this is actually up and running. Okay, so what we've done is, so the Terraform has gone through and stepped um, a couple of extra processes um, beyond just the base infrastructure. It's also gone through and it's enabled that Kubernetes config. Okay, so it's telling Vault that it trusts and is configured to talk back with that token API so that we can authenticate ourselves. Providing a role, so things that it's allowed to do in a mapping uh, to the uh, Kubernetes service account. And then what it's also doing is it supplying that uh, policy? So we've got that role-based access control. Again, here, don't follow any particular type of security uh, lessons from me for this demo. Um, but you can actually tell it what um, API paths you want it to have access to. Okay, so in this case, I have created God. Um, but essentially, that's applied, uh, and then you write that demo policy. You then set up GCP as that secrets backend. Okay, so it then knows exactly um, how to authenticate to GCP so it can go off and create those credentials. Because ultimately, you're still using GCP credentials. You're not using Vault. You're just basically using Vault as a pass-through mechanism to keep these dynamic credentials. And then applying that policy here uh, to your project. So that being said, now I'm actually inside the container, and yes, I know this is the worst thing to ever do at a DevOps conference is actually SSH into the container itself. Um, but uh, again, never let anything like this get in the way of a good demo. Uh, so what I'm going to do is change my 
directory and once again test my typing skills. And now I'm going to run my auth script. Okay, so what this is doing is it is taking the token from that memory store. It's then doing an API call with that token to Vault. Vault's saying, yes, you're um, who you are. You are who you say you are. I will now um, find the policy. Your policy says that you are GCP star. You can do anything that you want. Uh, I'm going to give you back a credentials uh, that you can use. And there you go. So right here is actually I've been returned back the uh, service account key for GCP. Okay, so this can also use with an OAuth workflow, but in this case we're just using service account keys. Um, but uh, that basically gives you the idea. So now you've got these credentials and you know um, that you can interact with GCP. If this was dynamic or built into an application, what you could do is also set um, that console template sidecar that watches Vault and says, okay, the credentials have changed. Now it's time to run through that, send that signal, run through that script again and upload with a new credential. Okay, so what that's doing now is, so this is just a very basic uploader Python script. Uh, it's using those credentials from that well-known path uh, into GCP uh, and it's uploading those. If I was to revoke those keys or those certificates, I would no longer be able to do that. If those keys rotated after their policy says that they expire after 30 minutes or five minutes or whatever you wanna do, you would have to send a signal to that application to reload those credentials once again. And again, this is where you use tools and sidecars like console template to do that. Um, and then just to check that it's actually uploaded and here we go. So, that's me done. Thank you.